All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Uh, after a jam-packed October of more than 60 live events, we are jumping into November, and it's going to be another crazy busy month uh, as well. So looking forward to seeing all of your classrooms, joining into live events, uh, and spending some time with us. Uh, if you haven't visited this month, head to exploringbytheseat.com. You can find all the events we have coming up um, and how to join, to register, to tune in live uh, or check them out via YouTube. So we've got a great event kicking off the month for us. We're really excited to have Dr. Mia Ronka joining us today. She's an ecologist, a science editor and journalist, writer and poet. She's an adjunct professor of environmental ecology at the University of uh, at the Biodiversity Unit of the University of Turku in Finland. She's the chair of the Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna Working Group, or CAFF for short, of the Arctic Council. Mia is also the chair of the Circumpolar Seabird uh, Expert Group under CAFF as well. So today she's gonna tell us a little bit about her experiences studying birds, the importance of birds to humans, and then a little bit about conservation of Arctic migratory birds. So I'm going to bring in Mia in with us live from Finland. Hi, Mia. How are we doing today? Fine. Fine. Thanks. Good morning. And I'm very happy to, to be with you. So thank you with the, for the invitation. Of course. We're, we're thrilled to have you kicking off our November. We've got classrooms joining us from Canada uh, and the United States. And we're really looking forward to learning a little bit more about you about birds and then of course I know there's going to be lots of questions from our students afterwards. Great, I'm looking forward to, to the discussion as well. All right, well Mia, I'm going to let you take over for a little bit uh, and share with us and then I'll come back for some questions. Thank you, I'm just sharing my my screen here just a minute. Please. Of course. I can see it loading um, up. There we go. Okay, so it's it's full screen now, or do you see it as, as full screen? Yep, looks good, Mia. Yes, excellent, thank you. So, uh, good morning, everyone, and, and hi from, from Nantal in southwestern Finland. Uh, I have the pleasure to, to share with you some thoughts about the importance of migratory birds and their conservation and uh, I'm I'm the CAF chair so so chairing the uh, biodiversity working group uh, so to say or or the conservation of arctic flora and fauna working group under the arctic council I'm going to tell you a bit later what that all is is about and, and also about the Arctic Migratory Birds Initiative that we that we have. So just as a short background about myself, um, I'm an ornithologist, a uh, biologist by background, um, a junk professor in environmental ecology at the University of Turku, uh, the biodiversity unit and uh, I have worked as a researcher, science editor, journalist, science writer and, and poet and, and what kind of drives me is the interest in the relationship and the connection between people and other species and uh, our environment and uh, the other theme that I'm interested in is communications and, and writing in particular. So um, I like to communicate these issues and, and in particular in, in writing. And uh, here in, in the front, you can see a couple of my, my books, my, my poem collection, Underground Birds, and the, uh, and the uh, textbook for, for children. Um, about bird agents, so a group of, of kids wanting to help to conserve birds and their adventure in, in doing that. Also in my poem performances I have used birds, so in, in the larger photo you can see my faithful 
companion, the stuffed raven that I have used in my my um, poem performances. It's a uh, 50 year old stuffed bird from the collections of the biodiversity unit. So it's a very nice, nice specimen. And currently I have been working more and more on the science art interface with, with that means uh, merging science and and art. Um, and I have also given workshops uh, for for children about birds, uh, pollinators, different kinds of uh, bugs, bees, for instance, and uh, and and bats as well. So. Um, Here's a question for for you that you can think about, and maybe we can return to this in the discussion part. I, I hope that you like birds, and uh, I would like to, you to think about why you may like them, why they are important to you. So, for instance, for my part, I can say that I, I think birds are beautiful. They are interesting. They kind of tell us about the status of our environment. Uh, that's what I have been uh, studying in my own research. They indicate environmental changes. Um, they are important also for other species. Uh, they can modify their habitats so, so that it allows also other species to, to thrive there. Uh, I like photographing birds. I like listening to to birds. And and you could also think about while while you are listening why you you like birds or or what is their importance to you. Uh, birds have been important for people for thousands of years for very long periods. Um, Here's an example from the Finnish national epic Kalevala, where there is this story, this one long poem that tells uh, or describes how the world was born from a golden eye egg. The text is in Finnish, I, I couldn't find it in, in English, but in, in the picture you can see the, the golden eye, and the text describes how there is this golden eye egg that gets broken and then kind of the bottom part becomes the earth and the upper part becomes the sky and, and then uh, the spots on on the eggshell uh, become the clouds and and the stars and then the yolk uh, becomes the, the, the sun and then also kind of the white part becomes the moon. So the whole world is born from this single bird egg, which kind of describes very nicely how important birds have been to people and, and how people have perceived them as, as very um, instrumental in, in their daily lives. Here are a couple of more examples about the importance of water birds. For instance, the uh, indigenous people uh, of the North in northern Scandinavia, the Sami people have painted uh, on the cliffs of the Alta Fjord in, in Norway uh, geese, ducks, gulls, and cormorants a very long time ago. In Siberia, there are two uh, groups of people the Dikanti and the Yakuts, and uh, for them also, uh, water birds were very important. So the Kanti, for instance, named the whole month of April after, you know, harvesting ducks by, by nets. So it was the duck net month and the Yakuts called the May for a May month for geese arrival month. And also in, in Faroe Islands, which is uh, a sub-Arctic island group in, in northern Atlantic, the spring arrival of the national bird oyster catcher, which, which is Chaldur in Faroese, 
is celebrated yearly on the 12th of March. And there in the photo, you can see a, uh, a sculpture of the Chaldur in, in Thorshavn, which is the capital of the Faroe Islands. Uh, birds have also been very common topic in in art and and often uh, the, the the species uh, or the phenomena that have uh, aesthetic values or are depicted in art or have religious values they have also been important in the daily uh, day uh, subsistence so when you know a species has been important for your survival then um, it has also been depicted in in art so so birds are present in a lot of different art forms from prehistoric cave paintings to uh, Japanese and science uh, Chinese art uh, the jewelry of ancient Finns architecture um, so for instance in the bottom left corner you can see the uh, main library at, at Tampere in Finland it's called the Kaperkeili and it's kind of this bird sitting with its head and, and neck neck up so it, it has gotten its form from this bird species and and also in yeah, Egyptian uh, religion the god of wisdom and writing the top uh, is all uh, often described as a man with an ibis head or kind of the sacred ibis uh, species and the god of heaven Horus is often described as a, a man with a falcon head and and uh, the Egypt Egyptians um, also often painted bird species on the walls of temples and, and burial vaults. So, so you have been able to, to identify 76 different bird species from these buildings. Further examples of, of birds in art are, for instance, rituals and ceremonies of indigenous peoples, classic music. For instance, the, the French composer Olivier Messiaen said that the birds are greatest musicians of the universe. So many, many composers have used uh, bird sounds or kind of the structure of the bird flight or the rhythms in their, in their work. Um, for instance, you may know the Swan Lake of Pyotr Tchaikovsky, the Russian composer. Um, you might also be familiar with the uh, film, the movie, The Birds by Alfred Hitchcock, or you might know the fables, so these kind of educational uh, animal stories of isops. They are often birds. Birds are also present in the Bible, for instance, and the poetry of, of many poets, actually ranging from Shakespeare and, and Shelley to to modern poets. Uh, here are a couple of examples of Finnish poetry. Um, Arto Hellakoski used the, the structure of the flight of the skylark in his poem, and, and Helena Sinervo in turn used the rhythm of the Tsoni owl mating call in, in one of her poems. And, and also in, in novels and fairy tales, there are a lot of birds, for instance, uh, in the fairy tale Ugly Duckling from the Danish writer Hans Christian Andersen, from which you can see see the uh, the uh, drawing in the top uh, bottom left left corner. Um, now it seems that the presentation is a bit stuck. Not moving at the moment that's okay mia uh sometimes if you just click on the presentation uh it might start moving again for you okay yes perfect thank you uh birds are also present in in different 
um, ancient beliefs and in particular birds that are are striking very very uh, easy to observe or somehow looked peculiar or or striking for for people for instance the black woodpecker in the painting uh, on the right hand side has been uh, thought that that it was a sign of, of death and uh, an old saying Finnish saying says that the laughter of the magpie does not bode well. People also observed the first sightings. It was always interesting if, if there was something rare or something that you saw for the first times, uh, time. And, and these often uh, gave them birth to, to different beliefs or, or sayings. And, and this was, of course, based on the fact that people relied very much on nature in their daily lives, for instance, in agriculture, in, in terms of timing, agricultural practices such as sowing and, and harvest. So they turned to nature to have advice, to have information that they could then use in their daily lives and, and subsistence. So um, I asked you why you, you like birds and and i also describe the uh, kind of artistic values of birds and the kind of umbrella umbrella um term for these benefits that that people gain from nature uh, is ecosystem services i don't know if you are familiar with the term but i have collected here some of the ecosystem services that birds provide to us people, so benefits that we get from birds. For instance, I mentioned that, that birds have been uh, used for, for food and, and their subsistence values have, have been uh, very important for people. So you can, can get meat from birds, eggs, feathers and down, fertilizers from the guano of, of the uh, um, different seabird species. Um, you can use, well, in, in East Asian cultures, bird nests of, of, of a uh, particular species have been used for food. Birds can also uh, regulate different processes in nature. For instance, scavengers can regulate the uh, occurrence of pests and, and diseases. Uh, for instance, um, Bird species can protect other species from predation, or they can remove fish from water courses and then, for instance, affect eutrophication of the water, so, so kind of ameliorate water quality. They provide different cultural services. I mentioned these artistic aesthetic values, uh, spiritual religious values, um, bird watching, photographing, you, you might like to go to, um, you know, nature conservation areas, hiking. I have done research on, on birds. Birds can be used for environmental monitoring, uh, education, teaching. And uh, they also provide these supporting services, which are kind of these background services that back up the production of all the other uh, ecosystem service types. So for instance, nutrient cycling and pollination. On the right hand side, you can see cave sugar birds that are very important pollinators of these protea um, plants that are indigenous in, in the uh, Cape, Cape Town area. And, and without these pollinating services, these species could not exist um, I said that I'm, I'm the chair of the CAF working group within the Arctic Council. Just some words still about uh, bird protection and the work of Arctic Council and, and CAF in bird protection. So the Arctic Council is a uh, intergovernmental forum promoting cooperation in the Arctic, in particular in terms of environmental protection and um, sustainable development. Um, there are representatives of the Arctic states, permanent participants, which mean um, organization for 
indigenous peoples in the Arctic and observers, for instance, states outside the Arctic area and intergovernmental organizations and, uh, and non-governmental organizations such as the World Wildlife Fund. And uh, most of the work goes on in six working groups of which CAF is one. So we concentrate on the conservation of Arctic flora and, and fauna and we can also be called the biodiversity working group of the Arctic Councils, Council. And our mandate is to address the conservation of Arctic biodiversity and to communicate our findings both to decision makers and the public in, in the Arctic area, also outside the Arctic, with the aim of uh, promoting practices that ensure the sustainability of the Arctic's living resources. So, so the different species, the, the biota um, and, and biodiversity. At the moment, uh, Finland is chairing CAF and Russia is chairing the Arctic Council. Um, these are always taking turns in, in two-year periods. You can see the working area of CAF. It's in the Arctic, uh, Arctic areas. Um, but of course, as, as you will see a bit later, also non-Arctic areas are important for, for the species that, that we are working on in, in CAF. So here you can see the member states of CAF and the observer states. And for instance, in our work for the pro protection of migratory species, the observer states are very important because many of the birds, even though they might breed in the Arctic, they migrate to, to other parts of the world. So they are kind of this living network connecting the, uh, the northern and the southern hemisphere. And uh, for the protection of, of Arctic birds, we have this AMBI, uh, Arctic Migratory Birds Initiative, this project that, that works on identifying threats to Arctic birds and, and to working on, on their conservation. And AMBI is working on four flyways, which you can see here in, in different, different colors. And uh, here you can see, see the, the logo of of AMBI. Um, behind uh, the, uh, that the AMBI was launched um, six years ago was the concern about the status of the Arctic bird populations. Um, there's now a new uh, report that has been published called the START, State of the Arctic Terrestrial Biodiversity Report. Um, and it reports on status and trends of terrestrial Arctic life, including uh, 88 bird species. And 20% of these species, according to re this report, have experienced declines. And uh, for well over half, at least one of the, of the populations has declined. So, so for many species and for bird communities in general, these news are alarming, of course. And uh, here you can see some examples of, of the declines in, in invaders. So for instance, there's the critically endangered swoon-billed sandpiper, which was the, uh, the species in the photo in, in the start of my presentation, it has gone down 90% uh, in just 40 years. So, so there are many endangered species and, and many species in, in very steep decline. Uh, reasons uh, to these declines are, for instance, the degradation uh, of, of, of habitats. Here you can see an example of a uh, a, a photo, a satellite image 
uh, from the Yellow Sea in China. And, and here you can see how these intertidal sites, the intertidal flats, have disappeared in the course of 30 years. So, so these intertidal areas on, on seashores, in coastal areas, they are very important staging areas, uh, wintering areas for many Arctic species, for instance, that are migrating through these areas or wintering there. And these areas are also under very um, high environmental pressures and, and drivers, and, and the, the land use there is very intensive, uh, which is why these habitats disappear and, and uh, but get uh, degraded, which affects the the ability of the birds to to stage there uh, during their migration and to overwinter there. Other concerns are bycatch, climate change, unsustainable harvesting, and and plastics pollution. And here you can see some examples of our target species, and in in the different colors, the different. Uh, environmental drivers that are affecting them on on the different flyways. Um, then, just to end with, I think I have used used my time. Uh, I would just like to make the point that that you, as the youth, are very important for our work, and in the Arctic Council and and also in CAF. We are working very hard to uh, enhance engagement of youth in different parts of our work. So CAF was the first uh, working group within the Arctic Council to have an Arctic uh, a youth uh, engagement strategy, where we um, try to think about different ways in, in which to engage youth. And uh, during CAF board meetings in, in Finland now, during the Finnish CAF chairship, we are visiting schools. For instance, here you can see our executive secretary from Tom Barry at the school of, of Kilpisjärvi talking about CAF. And on the left hand side, you can see me giving a, a workshop then in, in Finnish, meanwhile, for the younger kids that don't, don't yet speak English. So, thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any any questions and, and hear your comments. All right, Mia, well, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, you know, birds are, I think sometimes we take them for granted, all the important things they do for, for the ecosystem, whether it's um, spreading seeds around, uh, building new habitats, um, pollinating, and then of course, all the other value is food sources, not only for us, but other um, animals in the ecosystem, uh, and just that special value, right, of beauty and, and for art and how it inspires people. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for the work that you're doing through CAFF uh, to protect birds and, and those flyways and, and uh, areas for birds, because yeah, I'm, as I'm sure many students know, we're, we're losing a lot of species around the world and it's scary to see their numbers falling, especially migratory birds. Yes, yes, there's a strong concern for, for of course, birds in, in different areas, but, but also very strongly in the Arctic areas because they are losing habitats very rapidly, for instance, due to climate change effects. Absolutely. So, Mia, what I'd like to do now really quickly is while you were presenting, I pulled together a couple questions in a little mini Kahoot quiz for the students. So uh, I'm going to give them an opportunity to see how well they were paying attention and compete for the top spot uh, in the quiz. So uh, those who are joining us, um, I'm just going to have to pop up this banner. It looks like it came down. So Kahoot.it. There we go. If you head over to this site here, uh, Kahoot.it, or you can search for it in Google, it's going to bring you up to a page where it's asking you for a PIN number. I'm going to share that PIN number with you momentarily. If you're lucky enough in your classroom to have one-to-one -one technology, you can sign in uh, at your desk or your teacher could do it at the front of the room and you can shout out the right answer to uh, him or her. So different ways that you can join us. Let me share my screen and bring that quiz up for us. Let's do my entire screen today. There we go. Here is our PIN number. 
Uh, 644-4791. We'll see if we have some students join us in the next uh, 30 seconds or so before we start the quiz. Um, so kahoot.it, that's up on the screen for you. And then the pin number is 644-4791. Looks like I see some students joining us already. Um, four questions in today's quiz. Uh, 20 seconds for each question. Uh, if you get the answer right, of course, you get points. If you get the answer right quickly, you get even more points. If you get the wrong answer, but really fast, well, you still don't get anything. So that right answer is really important. And then the quicker you can put it in, uh, the better. So I'm going to give maybe 10 more seconds for a few more students to join us. Uh, and then we will take the quiz live. All right. Here we go, Mia. Let's see how our students do say, looks like we're about to hit 70 students and still going up, so that's great. Okay, here we go. Kickstarting that first question in three, two, one. Where is Mia calling us from today? So we introduced that right at the beginning. It was at Finland, Spain, England, or Italy. Where are we talking to Mia from uh, today? Few more seconds on the clock. Lots of answers coming in. All right, most students went with Finland. Good job, everyone. Let's check out our leaderboard. Ewan is in the lead, but it is close. Lots of people coming in behind. Let's go for question number two. What is the name for a scientist who studies birds? Is it a herpetologist, an ichthyologist, an ornithologist, or an entomologist? What is the name of a scientist who studies birds? Herpetologist, ichthyologist, ornithologist, or entomologist? Oh, a little bit of a spread on that one, but most went with ornithologist. A herpetologist studies reptiles, ichthyologist fish, uh, and an entomologist insects. So good job to those who picked ornithologist. And Ronan has taken the lead with that one. Question three, here we go. What is an example of how birds can help ecosystems? Do they create new habitats? Can they disperse seeds after they eat fruit? Are they pollinators or all of the above? So ecosystem services, ways that birds, well, and, and really any animal kind of helps the environment uh, for free, like insects, uh, bats eating insects and things like that. All of the above, yes, birds can create new habitats, they disperse seeds, and they're pollinators. Aditi is in the lead. We have one more question to go. Anything can happen. What is a flyway? Is it a bird that's flying out of control? Is it a bird, a spot birds like to rest? Is it a route that migratory birds take? Or is it an ecosystem with lots of birds? What is a flyway? Couple more seconds. All right, most students went with a route that migratory birds take. Let's see where our final leaderboard is. Third place, Charlotte. Good job, Charlotte. Second place, Aditi. And first place. All right, Ronan coming back into first place. All right, awesome, great job everybody. Definitely paying attention today uh, and great answers to those questions. What do you say, Mia, are you ready for some questions? Yes, yes, ready. All right, before I do that, I do wanna share that uh, our fourth grade class uh, was Miss Piero who's joining us. They put some reasons in the chat why they love birds. They said they have amazing wingspans. Um, they say that they love the colors of some birds. They're impressed by how they can grip. Uh, they love their different beaks. They like to watch them at bird feeders. Uh, so there's a few from that class. Our grade six virtual class said they love birds because they help control the worm population. Uh, and they think they're cute too. So that's a few reasons that some of our students were thinking of when you uh, mentioned uh, why they might like birds. So uh, let's visit our first group. We're gonna go to uh, that fourth grade class joining us in New York. Um, it's Miss Piero's group. If their mic's not working, so if they wanna pop a question or two in the chat, I'll keep an eye out for those questions. 
But let's go to a uh, grade six class now in Brampton. Miss McIntosh's crew uh, is hanging it out with us. Let's bring them into the call. There we go. And here they are. I see someone waiting for us. Uh, hi, hey. my name is and I have a question. What medicines are made from birds? Did you catch that, Mia? He's wondering, are there medicines, any medicines that can be made from birds? <laughs> Mia, can you still hear me okay? Okay, Ms. McIntosh's class, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Um, I know Mia was having a little bit of, oh, there we go. It looks like her, her device is reconnecting. Mia, can you hear me again? Yeah, okay, perfect. So our, our student, Ms. McIntosh's class was wondering, uh, what kind of medicine, is there any medicine that birds can be used for? Oh no, I hope we haven't lost Mia for our Q&A. Uh, let's give a moment here. I might ask her uh, to exit and come back in uh, if things unfreeze on her end. So we'll just, there we go. We'll give her a little moment here. Yes, it's, it seems that my connection is a bit unstable, but now I can hear, hear and see you. Okay, again. perfect. So, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question. Can you please repeat it? All right, do you want to ask again, bud? Okay, what medicines are made from birds? Ah, what 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 medicines are are made of birds? Yes, that's that's an an, an excellent question. Um, so so birds. Um, well, in uh, in uh, many parts of the world, uh, different plants and 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 birds or and and different species have been used for medicinal use and and actually now i don't remember in in english the the bird bird species so so i would need to to look that that up but for instance many indigenous peoples have used different uh species in in nature so both animal and uh, plant species for medicinal medicinal uses and and this is a very long long uh, tradition and, and, and long um, long um, way of, of uh, you know using nature or, or benefiting nature that it is, is based on experiences for for hundreds and, and thousands of, of years. Yeah, I uh, saw an interesting example of goose oil being used on cuts. That's one example that I've heard of. So uh, it's interesting how, how things like that uh, are learned many, many years ago and then passed on um, and maybe not used so much anymore. But uh, like you said, plants uh, and various animals have been used in medicine for thousands of years. Um, all right, very cool. So let's grab uh, another group here. We're going to go to uh, Victoria Cedarview. So uh, these are seventh graders in Ottawa with Miss Nedco. Let me bring uh, them into the call here. Here they come. Hi, guys. Hey, Ottawa. Hi. Ava, do you want to ask your question? Um, what bird do we need most, or like that helps the environment and habitats most? Okay, so so what bird would be the most beneficial for for the habitats? That's very difficult to to say because as as you could see in my presentation, the birds have very different roles in ecosystems, and and uh, they are all needed. So, so one bird can can do something, and the other bird species can do something else. 
and you can can't get by you know without uh, any of of them but uh, as an example of birds that have a very large um which which uh, effects on their habitats is is very very large are for instance different seabird species and uh, for instance goose species um because they can kind of affect the whole structure of their habitats and the structure and species composition of the vegetation, for instance, by which they are, are affecting the whole ecosystem and, and also the ability of other species to, to utilize uh, those, uh, those sites and, and habitats. Uh, seabirds also bring in a lot of nutrients from the sea, so that's why on, on the cliffs and islands where seabirds nest, there, the, the vegetation can be very lush and, and supporting many other species, which would not uh, be possible without the seabirds bringing in a lot of nutrients from, from the sea. So, so those would be a couple of species that have a very large influence, but as said, all the different roles that, that birds are having in the, in the ecosystems, they are all, uh, even though they are different and, and many of them might not be so visible perhaps for us people, but they are all important. All right, great question. And absolutely, absolutely right. We don't always see what's happening in ecosystems and you know every piece and why it's important, um, but, uh, yeah, all birds play roles. And I think that was a great example using the seabirds and, and all the nutrients they bring to the shore, especially in those remote uh, island areas. Uh, okay, we're gonna head to Welland. We've got some grade sixes hanging out uh, with us in Welland. Let me bring them into the call here. Okay, here they come. Hi, um, so we're virtual. So my students are learning from home. But we do Today have I'm a few like questions. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Hear me? Oh, you can hear me. Yeah. So um, we had a couple questions. Uh, one being, um, why do you think people oh, harm Mr. birds? Oh, Mr. Paz on television. Wow. Why do you think I is the main know. reason why they might You're harm birds? Famous, Mr. Well, that's a very good question, and that's actually also very important when we are uh, thinking about any environmental effects or, or effects on, on biodiversity that people have. So in my presentation, I, I listed some of the uh, ways in which people can harm birds, for instance, um, harvesting and, uh, and uh, bycatch in, in, in fisheries and destroying their, their habitats um changing the climate uh which in terms uh, which in turn then has has uh effects on 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 the habitats and and the species um some of the reasons why could be that we don't realize what what we are doing so so we might not always know what effects our actions are, are having on, on species and, and uh, the environment. But also, it might be that, for instance, in, in societies, then other values are considered as, as more important, for, in, for instance, economic values or that life is comfortable, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so, or, or it, it could be. Well, I, I don't. I don't think that that people, um, you know, on purpose would like, for instance, drive species to extinction. The, uh, for instance, in in Finland, the beginning of the conservation movement was because people were actually horrified about what effects we have had on 
on other species. So, so in the beginning, people didn't realize that we can actually drive other species to extinction. So I, I don't think that that uh, people have wanted to do that, but but maybe we have not realized what we have been doing on then or then we have kind of valued other things more. But as you could see from the presentation, uh, all our well-being is is based on nature and the functioning of the ecosystems and biodiversity. So so it's uh, we should realize that we just can't keep on missing missing uh, species and and uh, destroying nature because it it will affect our our lives in in many ways. I I hope I answered your question. Okay, so we have a question from our fourth graders. They typed it in the chat for me. And they're wondering, Mia, about how many different species of birds are there in the world? About how many are there? I know we probably don't know the exact number, but what's a, what's a good estimate? Yes, thank you, a very good question. There are about 11,000 species of, of birds and uh, the, uh, the species number of birds is quite well known in relation when compared to many other species groups because they are quite visible you know big easy to identify easy to observe so so there aren't maybe in the wild so many species still that would be would not be known to to science but then again when identification uh, gets better and, and people know more about uh, how to, for instance, use DNA to separate species, then new species can actually be found among uh, museum specimens. Uh, earlier you have thought that, okay, all these specimens are one species, but then when you take a closer look with new methods, then for instance, uh, you can find that, okay, this that was thought to be one species, it's actually 11 species. So, so nowadays, you know, a new bird species are discovered in the museums, not not in the wild, uh, so more uh, so, so much anymore. Okay, so I want to grab a question or two from YouTube, Mia. Before we wrap up, we have the SDG warriors joining us all the way from India, and they've noticed that in the Arctic you see birds nesting in huge groups. So how they're wondering. What trick do the parents use to find their young in such big groups uh, of birds? Yes, uh, very good, good question, and and uh, kind of describes the how how wonderful creatures birds birds are. Uh, for instance, uh, when there are these uh, large colonies of of penguins, where then there can be tens of thousands of, of birds and then the uh, the uh, adults go to find food and then get back to their their chicks uh, then the parents use the the sounds and the smells of of their chicks to to find them and to identify them uh, many birds have actually a very good sense of of smell and and uh, well, they can some species also see very well and and have very good hearing, but uh, their sense of smell is is very good and and that they can use when uh, identifying other other uh, individuals and and also in in navigating actually. Okay, now it's my turn for a slow computer. That was a slow, a slow reboot. Uh, Miss Alexander's class wants to know: Should we think about bird migration when planning projects like wind turbines? Uh, wind, yes, yes, uh, yes. Um, very good question and and very relevant question. The the answer is yes. So so in in planning uh, wind energy parks, in particular in coastal areas where 
often the bird flyways go so so in the areas through which uh, birds are migrating um it should definitely be taken into account uh, where, where the birds migrate in in the kind of when uh when this designing or planning where to locate these these wind parks there are also other ways um you know with existing wind parks you can also uh, um, uh, lessen the risk of, of uh, bird collisions with different lights, uh, colors in, in the turbines. So, so there are many studies actually about how to uh, decrease the risk of, of bird, bird collisions. But the first, uh, first uh, thing that you should do, of course, is, how, is, is think very, very carefully about where to place these these wind wind parks. All right, I'm going to bring Victoria Cedarview in one more time because they, they, they just put in the chat that they had one more question. Hi. Hi. One more question. Go oh, for it. There you are, McKenna. Sorry. Uh, is it the same with birds that the more colorful they are, the more poisonous and venomous they are? Good question. Thank you. Very very good question. Um, some of the birds can actually uh, be poisonous. They they can um, get get these substances from their their prey, and and also, well, some species can also actually uh, contain alcohol, with which uh, they get, for instance, when when eating berries in in the winter. But usually the colors of the birds they signal uh, different different um, issues such as their kind of uh, the, the fitness their capability of of uh, you know reproduce and 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 get a mate so so usually these very bright colors uh, are for signaling that that look at me I'm I'm a, a very Nice individual, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, good good to you know establish a, a family family with me and and uh, and produce chicks. So so, so it's uh, it's often for this sexual selection that that birds have these these uh, bright colors. All right. Well, Mia, there's so many questions from our students today. Would you be okay uh, if after our, our chat, I shared uh, your email with them so they can send you some more questions if they have a few more questions? Yes. Yes, of course. All there right. There have been many, many great questions and they also show how, how much you actually already know, know about birds. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I want to start off with a huge shout out to the Gardner Foundation this month. They are sponsoring our month uh, of live events. So you'll see throughout the month, we're going to have uh, a lot of events around uh, the human body and medicine this month. Uh, so we're really excited to have the Gardner Foundation supporting us this month. I want to do a shout out to our YouTube classrooms. Thanks for joining us with your great questions. Thank you for um, playing in the Kahoot to our camera classrooms this morning. Thanks for joining us bright and early uh, and those great questions, of course. And Mia, thank you so much for starting our November and getting us thinking about our feathered friends because they do so much for us um, and they are in trouble, especially migratory species. So we should be paying attention and we should be doing things to help uh, protect them because in the end, it's gonna help us uh, as well. Thank you very much. All right, awesome. I well, hope everybody has a great day. Don't forget to visit the website and see all the events we have coming up this month. Uh, but for now, we are going to sign off. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.